Tripoli in northern Lebanon, the poorest city in the country and located around 30 kilometers from the Syrian border. Most of the shops in the center are closed down. A booming business just two years ago, today the gold market district resembles a ghost town. The only customers now are residents looking to cash in their remaining belongings. I came to sell you this ring, and this one too. That's 18 karat gold. This pensioner is parting with her last items of jewelry. They're all she has to ensure her survival. Our situation is terrible. Our government is letting us die. Shame about the jewelry, but I have four children to feed. $155. That's all? Okay then, I've got some silver too. She's selling her husband's wedding ring to buy some food for her family. I'll buy some flour, rice, bulgur, and a bit of meat. May God help us. Tripoli is bearing the full brunt of the economic crisis that has crippled the country. 5,000 for a bunch of chard. A few stalls still have a full range of products on offer, but the prices of food have shot up. How much is the fish? 70,000 pounds. We've dropped the price by 5,000. Thanks. How much for those chicken legs? 40,000 pounds and the neck sell for 28,000. We used to feed them to the dogs. Today we eat them ourselves. The chicken legs and the fish fillet cost 15 times more than they did two years ago. But while prices are going through the roof, wages across Lebanon have remained static. And as seen in Tripoli, getting enough to eat has become a daily challenge. Just imagine, back in the days of our former prime minister, who the government now calls incompetent, this bag of rice cost 2,500 pounds. Today it's seven times that. How's that supposed to work? How are poor people in this country supposed to eat? Of all the 128 representatives, or rather, complete idiots, there's not a single one of them who's decent and humane. Raging discontent has been building now for several years. On October 17, 2019, it exploded. For the first time since the end of the Civil War, a broad cross-section of Lebanese society joined together and took to the streets in unison to demand that the corrupt government resign. It wasn't so long ago when Lebanon was described as the Switzerland of the Middle East. The economy was strong and the country attracted investment from all around the globe. The small country shares borders with Syria and Israel. For decades now, government cabinet positions have been assigned by religious affiliation and distributed among Christians, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, a delicate compromise that had long been stable. But everything changed in 2019. The banking system collapsed. Investors in dollars fled the country. Inflation rose to higher than 140 percent, the highest rate in the world at that time. We only earn a quarter of what we spend. The Lebanese pound, or lira, lost 90 percent of its value. Lots of monopoly money. <laughs> This unprecedented crisis has plunged a large portion of Lebanon's population into poverty. If it hadn't been for the Christian community, they would have starved, literally starved. The government failed to maintain investments. Now electricity is supplied for just a few hours each day. That's Lebanon today. And for over a decade now, Lebanon has also had to master an influx of 1.5 million refugees from Syria. Some blame the government for driving the country to bankruptcy, also given its supposed control over entire sectors. This is one of the most corrupted areas, not even in Lebanon, I believe in the universe. The crisis has reignited tensions between the different religious groups. For many Lebanese, their last resort is to leave the country. Hands up if you want to leave Lebanon after college. It's the only hope of a better future, and reflects a Lebanon 
fighting for its survival. This is Ashrafye, a Christian district of Beirut. Father Gabriel is getting ready to say Mass. He's Catholic, a Jesuit, and French-speaking, like his congregation and the majority of the country's Christian middle class. People come here to do more than hear the word of the Lord. Many are also in attendance to hear the critical words of the priest's sermons. Today's gospel is really timely. What should we do? Christmas is just around the corner, and we can only hope for the penitence of our political class. You can only hope that our political class asks, in the sense of St. John, what should we do? He would tell them, give back the money you stole and leave this land. Go work on your tans on the French Riviera. I won't say more, because I want to sleep in my bed. And you do, too. Gabriel makes politically charged digressions like this because he's experiencing the crisis firsthand. You've gotten too thin. I'll give you 10 kilos of mine. Every week, the priest leaves Beirut and travels to Beka, a mountainous region in the eastern part of the country. Just like he does every time he gets in his car, Gabriel checks the fuel gauge. Every time the tank is down to two-thirds, you get gas, so it doesn't feel like you're paying so much. Fill her up, please. The price of gas has risen six-fold within one year. How much, my brother? 300,000. Here you go. Thanks. So we're full again, 300,000. That's madness. 20 liters of gas costs half the monthly minimum income in Lebanon, exorbitant prices that severely limit the ability of people to get from A to B. It's amazing. There's hardly any traffic. Imagine the Arc de Triomphe in Paris at rush hour on a Monday with about two-thirds fewer cars. That's the way it is here. Gabriel's consternation stems from the fact that three years ago, Lebanon was doing pretty well. Gasoline was cheap, people had work, the currency was stable. Today, it's all falling apart and members of the country's middle class are among the first to lose out. They've been called the nouveau pauvre, the new poor. After a two-hour drive, Father Gabriel arrives in Zahle. Since the start of the crisis, the Christian city of 80,000 residents has become a ghost town. There's not a soul to be seen on the traditional shopping street. The elderly and isolated residents are experiencing the worst societal degradation in their history. A local charity group helps the poorest of the poor. Gabrielle lends a hand with its members every week. How are you, Father? Fine, thanks. We've got a lot to do today. Our goal is to give hungry people who don't have money something to eat. They're prepared meals. Here are the salads. Here we have desserts. And those are the warm meals. Today, Father Gabriel is working alongside Rahida. Let's go to Jeanette. I've put everything on the table for you. And how about the bills? My brothers help me. Every month they give me a little money. God bless you. My sister. The charity supports more than 200 families. Where can I put this? How are you? My dear father, thank you for coming, thank you. Thank you. 
In Lebanon, pensions can be paid out monthly or be received in a one-time payment. Sabua was a teacher for 30 years and chose the lump sum option, 300 euros. It's lovely here. We used to be better off and could buy heating oil and wood. Now everything's extremely expensive. I have trouble with my eyes and need injections, but a single injection costs 800,000 pounds, plus the doctor's fee of 350,000. He didn't give me the injection this month because I couldn't pay for the one from last month. So what if you miss an injection? He prescribed drops and said that I should come back in six weeks' time. What can I do? How can you live like this, when you only earn a quarter of what you spend? Each injection costs the equivalent of 50 euros. Gabriel does all he can to help her. Here, take the 300,000. That's for the shot. It's from Jesus. Thanks, it's too much. At the end of the street, they find greater hardship and rage. This family has lived here for 20 years. The father used to be a painter. He's jobless now. In the current economic situation, it's impossible to find another job. They simply have no income. Inside, there's a tiny kitchen, a toilet, and a living room, which the entire family also uses as a bedroom and the refrigerator is desperately bare. What do you do when you want to make a meal for the family? Sometimes I go to the market and the vendors give me food they haven't sold. Otherwise, there's still the Johanna restaurant. We can get some food there too. God isn't forgetting us. The mother puts her faith in God, while her husband looks to human assistance, such as that provided by Gabriel. Do you use the heating? So what's the stove for? It's just for show. <laughs> Does it make you mad that the state doesn't take care of you? What can I say? I don't have any work. And I've got five people to feed. Do you hate the state? The state? What state? We'd starve without the help of these charities. If you were working before the crisis, you could pay your electric bill, no trouble. But with the inflation we have today, that's impossible. It's far too expensive. How are you supposed to manage without going out on the street and begging? Thirty-six percent of the population lives in extreme poverty. That's nearly five times more than two years ago. What would have happened to this family without the Christian community? They would have starved. Literally. Literally starved. Communities across the country, whether Christian, Muslim or Druze, are relying on local charity to survive. Nobody saw this kind of brutal economic collapse coming in which, for many people, daily life has become a nightmare within just two years. In Shuafat, a southern suburb of Beirut, we visit a grocery store. Riyadh has been running the shop for the last four years. The ongoing crisis in the country has seen him become a master of improvisation. There's no electricity anymore, so I can't shut my blinds anymore. Now he has a new morning ritual. Once I get here, I turn on the phone and check the dollar exchange rate. The lira and the dollar have always existed side by side in Lebanon's economy. Until 2019, the exchange rate between the two currencies was stable, with one dollar equal to 1,500 pounds. The exchange rate changes daily. On this morning, a dollar was worth 21,000 pounds, almost 15 times more than two years ago. The dollar rate keeps rising, so supplier prices are rising too. I have to continually adjust my prices. Can you give me the calculator? Okay. That's Dimex 1.2 liters. 
Today it costs 16,800 pounds. Put 18% onto that and, okay, price it at 19,824 pounds. That's how he's now pricing his products, which even he has trouble finding. The state is only providing one to two hours of electricity a day in this area. To keep frozen foods from spoiling, Riyadh has had to make further adjustments. I can't be selling products that make people sick, so I decided to only keep using one freezer and unplug the rest. I've also had to reduce my selection. As if by magic, the electricity comes back on at noon. The staff can get back to work as normal. Eggs, potatoes and that's all? For more than a year now, Riyadh hasn't earned a proper profit at his shop. Some months he doesn't even break even. Lebanon is currently a shadow of its former self, in more ways than one. Beirut was once the nightlife capital of the Middle East, but for most, those all-night parties are now a distant memory. The dollar has become a scarce commodity in Lebanon. A series of foreign investors left the country in 2019 due to dwindling confidence in the Lebanese government. Their departure sparked the nation's financial collapse. The lira lost almost 90% of its value. Lebanon's banks set severe withdrawal limits for those Lebanese who had dollars. The aim was supposedly to prevent the state going bankrupt. Rebecca hasn't had any access to some of her bank accounts since 2019. So here it says card limit exceeded, so I cannot withdraw anymore as if I exceeded the limit, but I haven't withdrawn any US dollars in more than one year. This is so, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. She does have more than $10,000 on this account, but in light of the situation in Lebanon, it's impossible to say if that money still exists. How many cars do you have? Uh, three, one fresh, one not fresh, and one Lebanese uh, lira. What do you call fresh dollars? Fresh dollars is all the dollars that were transferred from outside after 20, 2019. The other dollar is the one that's stuck in the bank. This is everything that you have dollars before 2019. You cannot withdraw any of it. Any? Any of it. You just see it and you cannot withdraw. So only fresh you can withdraw. These fresh dollars are akin to the holy grail for those who have access to them. They come from outside the country and are now worth a fortune when exchanged against the devalued local currency. They've led to the development of a new privileged social class. Our next stop is a beach resort near Batroun, an hour's drive north of Beirut. Here there are a number of people who have been left unscathed by the crisis. The big supermarket chains are still crowded. How are you? Joseph, now in his early 40s, moved here four years ago. This is my village. Do you come here often? Sure. About three or four times a week. Joseph is a sales representative at an international pharmaceutical company, and he gets his monthly salary in dollars. Where are the ripe tomatoes? Those nice ripe ones. Okay. Thanks to those fresh dollars, Joseph and his wife Romy now live like royalty in a ruined Lebanon. Is alcohol expensive now in Lebanon? For Lebanese people, yes. So you're not Lebanese? <laughs> no, I am, but Lebanese with fresh money. So is that a new class or a new type of Lebanese? A new type of Lebanese. Before it, it was like for $10 only, this bottle. Now for the Lebanese, it's like, like 2,000. They cannot afford it anymore. It's nothing for me. 2,000 lira, 
Joseph's monthly salary is $3,000 or 60 million Lebanese pounds. Have you become rich? Yes, I've gotten rich. When we're buying everyday items, we don't look at the price anymore. Romy is a primary school teacher. She's paid in Lebanese pounds. Without Joseph's dollars, she wouldn't manage to get by. Now the couple have no reason to worry when they approach the checkout. Their bill today, 685,000 pounds. That's equivalent to $30, about equal to the minimum monthly wage in Lebanon, a minimum wage that has plummeted by a factor of 15 in two years. It's now lower than the minimum income in Afghanistan. Joseph and his wife have built a house in this residential area in the hills above Batroun. They started the undertaking in 2017 when they took out a 20-year mortgage for 50 million Lebanese pounds. But with the local currency collapsing, their 150 square meter house cost them only about $2,500. It was a sum they paid back in two months. There are three rooms and a fourth room on the upper floor in the back. We're only using it as a storage room right now. We have three floors. This Sunday, they've invited friends to lunch. Joseph receives his guests with a meal fit for royalty. They need, I think, more than 10 minutes. He wants to share his new wealth with others. Rami is a public servant, for example. Each month, he's paid in Lebanese pounds. So for this friend of the couple, buying a $6 bottle of wine was a huge expense. I get paid about 80 or $85 a month. That's enough to fill the car twice with gas. Before, I earned about $1,200. Now, about $80. The difference is enormous. Despite the inflation in Lebanon, wages have never been adjusted. As the friends make a toast, Joseph adds, hang in there. Only about 13% of the Lebanese population are paid in dollars. Everyone else is paying a hefty bill for this crisis. The absurdity of the situation has driven some to campaign for a fairer economy. Rebecca has an appointment with her lawyer. As usual, there's no power. Across the country, you'll hear the same reaction. <laughs> That's Lebanon today. A year ago, Rebecca decided to file a lawsuit against her bank for illegally withholding her dollars. What happened? We were supposed to have an appointment at Biblos Bank. Yes, but they cancelled it. I don't know when we'll be able to resume proceedings. Unfortunately, nothing is moving in our direction at the moment, but we shouldn't give up. There's no law allowing this informal freeze on her and other people's savings. The banks were closed for weeks because of the protests. And when they opened after two weeks, there was nothing left. We're really dealing with a mafia that decided to steal people's money by transferring it to their own accounts abroad. Who are these people? Politicians, bankers, and the governor of the central bank, Riyad Salameh. I reckon it's the biggest scam in history. We're talking here about $100 million that just disappeared. A political and business elite is being blamed for impoverishing the country to benefit their private interests. In 2019, a French broadcaster asked the governor of the central bank, Riyad Salamé, about the money that had been wired abroad. In Lebanon, we're free to transfer money. But we're examining events from an ethical standpoint to see if politically exposed persons who transferred money abroad 
use their positions in a way that might constitute an abuse of power. Ironically, Riyad Salame is himself one of the people accused of taking part in this massive capital flight as a private individual. He and his brother have around $300 million on one of their bank accounts in Switzerland. Is that consistent with his bank salary? Certainly not. The Lebanese banking sector is said to have been functioning for decades like a Ponzi or pyramid scheme, a fraudulent financial scam that promises very attractive interest. In order to pay the latter, the banks use the money they get from new customers. But when that source of money dries up, the pyramid collapses. When the first investors fled Lebanon, the entire country ended up paying the price. There are people like Rebecca's parents who worked their whole lives long and thought, we've saved money for our retirement or to allow our children to study abroad. And now they're left with nothing. The whole thing is the bank heist of the century. In 2016, a study showed that 90% of the majority shareholders in Lebanese banks were relatives of politicians. Nepotism of this kind has already had devastating consequences. On August 4, 2020, warehouse number 12 exploded in the port of Beirut. Its contents, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, a highly flammable and explosive fertilizer, stored unattended. The horrific accident destroyed entire districts of the capital within a radius of several kilometers. In total, it left 218 people dead and more than 6,500 injured. To the surprise of some, after the disaster, the president of Lebanon appealed to the resilience of the Lebanese people, rather than focusing on an emergency plan. Ladies and gentlemen, today Beirut is trying to raise itself from the ruins. With the efforts of every single Lebanese and with their support, the city's wounds will heal and it will rise again, just as it has always done in its history. The relatives of the victims have yet to find peace, even today. On the fourth day of every month, they gather at the port to remember their loved ones. Today is my Jessica's birthday. Do you know what it's like when a mother cannot celebrate her daughter's birthday? In the space of seconds, my soulmate, my wife, had been taken from me. I spent 34 years with her. The issue is a highly sensitive one, with many blaming the government. The subsequent investigation was entrusted to Tarek Bitar, a judge said to be incorruptible, a rarity in Lebanon. All I want is justice. I hope Judge Bitar sees this through to the end. All of us here support him. But Bitar's investigation got bogged down. This day marked the third time it was suspended. Members of the government who refused to be questioned were obstructing his work through legal challenges. The judge knows the truth, and we know exactly who killed these victims and blew up the port. And there's one man in the country who has a special degree of interest in this case. Riyad Kobeisi is an investigative journalist who is relentlessly trying to get to the bottom of the country's corruption. Every morning, his drive to work takes him past the port.
the best area to stop is here, somewhere here. Yeah. I know where from the outside, not from the inside because I'm not allowed to enter there. Yeah. According to Kobeisi, several members of the government knew for years about the ammonium nitrate being stored at the port. This is one of the most corrupted areas, not even in Lebanon, I believe in the universe. It's like the black hole of corruption. To a certain extent, this place is kind of like of a microcosm of Lebanon. It's operated by mafia men, appointed by mafias, elected via democratic process. You cannot be appointed there. It's not only that you have to be affiliated with a certain party. More than that, some people, actually not some people, the, most of them paid a lot of money in order to be appointed here. As for example, when it comes for the custom controller, with our calculations, he used to be paid like uh, $2,000 per day. Per day. Per day. And if, if, he, if he got only $2,000 per day, he will be pissed. According to official statistics, the port earns about 200 million U.S. dollars in income annually. Kobeisi says that without the corruption, that figure would be close to 25 billion. The journalist takes risks as he takes on the powerful. After one of his investigations, he was physically attacked a few years ago by a port official. Since then, he's been taking precautions. My own surveillance system, there are like 10 cams inside the car just to make sure that uh, in case anyone decided to attack me, just to have my story documented. His wife is a presenter with the same broadcaster. Hi. Are you proud of his work? Yes, but sometimes he gives me headaches. Why? Because it's dangerous. I'm afraid something bad will happen. She's scared for you. Yeah, I mean... I'm telling him every every time I'm telling him this, but uh, it's awful. You're not going to change your work? I told you, I tried to act like a gazelle. It didn't work. Why? I'm a beer. And Kobeisi refuses to be intimidated. The journalist has published the results of his investigation of the port blast online. His website features the faces of politicians linked to the incident and makes all the evidence he's collected available. That includes a letter written by Colonel Joseph Scaff. Back in 2014, the customs official had already been sounding the alarm. There's a ship by the name of Rosas docked at key number 11 in the port of Beirut. On board is a large cargo of a dangerous explosive that constitutes a danger to public safety. We ask that the ship be removed from the key. Ultimately, no action was taken. The colonel died in suspicious circumstances in March 2017. Despite suspicions of murder, the investigation said the cause of death was an accidental fall. This combination of patronage and incompetence and negligence and corruption, this is the pure mixture of the bomb itself. I know that there's a lot of corruption in Mexico, maybe, in many other countries, but not like in Lebanon. Why? Why? Because there are countries where there are like dominant mafias. But in Lebanon, this country is owned by the mafias. They own the country. A country drifting rudderless. And to make matters worse, it's hungry. In this situation, just the tiniest spark could cause tensions to escalate and explode which is what happened in October 2021. Followers of the Shia Amal movement, which is allied with the powerful Hezbollah party, were demonstrating in front of the Palace of Justice. They demanded that the Christian judge Tarek Batar be withdrawn from investigating the explosion at the port. They accused him of being under the influence of foreign powers and in particular of targeting Shia politicians. Sectarianism, the plague of Lebanon, was back. Late in the afternoon, heavily armed demonstrators went to the entrance of the Christian quarter in Beirut. 
Within seconds, the situation took a dramatic turn as the demonstrators came under fire. The subsequent street battles between Christians and Shias lasted five hours. Seven people were killed, all of them Shia. Ali is 60 years old. Since his youth, he's been a militiaman in the armed wing of the Shia Amal party. A passing Shia resident then joins the conversation. Her building was among those that came under the heaviest fire. We were watching the young people on the street, and then suddenly they started shooting from this side, and everyone ran away. Where do you live? What story? The fifth. Up there. We were in the apartment. The resident then agrees to us visiting her home. As she takes us along to see the damage, the Shia militiaman Ali follows right on our heels. She's been living here for 14 years with her husband and three children. We hid in the bathroom. There was no way out. The shots came from this side. This wall was riddled with bullet holes. It was horrible. We were terrified. The family filmed the hellish scenes on their phones. Her youngest son, Abbas, is 13. He's still in shock. We put this up as a barricade to protect ourselves if they came with a rocket launcher. There were four of us here. Were you afraid of the rocket launchers? Yes, they had rocket launchers, M14s, M16s and a few grenades. I was here, my neighbor was here, my father here. And my sister further away. And how long were you in there? At least two and a half hours. Two and a half hours? Yes. Were you scared? A bit, not much. The whole family was evacuated after what seemed like an eternity. Are you afraid it will start again? Yes, of course. I live with the stress. It reminded me of the Civil War. I thought, here it goes again. The family does not want to see the different religious communities at war with each other. Their children go to a Christian school. And alongside the Quran, they even have an image of the patron saint of Christians in Lebanon. Our neighbors are Christians, Muslims, all religions. We're one. That's not the problem. At the same time, it almost seems as if Ali is getting ready for a possible return of civil war. All of Lebanon is armed. There are weapons everywhere. In the 1990s, all the militia had to surrender their arms to the government. The Amal group did it too. But when they began to provoke us again, we went out and got some other guns. As a militiaman, I'm not afraid. I'm ready to go to war for my party. I don't agree with what he's saying. It's an absurd war. It's not in the interests of anyone in Lebanon to live like that. We want to live in peace and raise our children in peace. It's nonsense that every citizen should be armed. The ghost of bloody sectarianism returned to haunt Lebanon on that fateful day, even if a majority of people in the country are trying to exercise this specter. One million Lebanese have already left this broken land. Public services in all areas have come to a standstill the government allowed health services to fall into disrepair. As it did public construction projects and the power grid. 
tired of promises of a better life that will never be realized, some are ready to risk their lives to flee the country. Among them is Mohammed, who lives in Tripoli. Go. Get out of the kitchen. The 35-year-old former tour guide lives with his entire family in this two-room apartment, with his mother, his sisters, and his four children. In October 2021, he and his son Hossam tried to enter Europe illegally via the sea. The plan was to have the rest of the family follow after they got there, but the trip was a short one. There were 82 of us and we'd bought a big boat. Our plan was to go to Italy and from there each of us would find their own way through Europe. But fate had different plans. We lost everything. The Turkish Coast Guard arrested us. And when did we meet again? In jail. You were in jail? Yes. And how old were you then? Seven. There were 16 people to a cell in jail. It was tough. Just imagine it. My son was sleeping with me on a bench, surrounded by Daesh terrorists. Mohammed and his son were arrested during the crossing to Europe and spent 29 days in jail before being sent back to Lebanon. In spite of the traumatic experience, the temptation to leave the country has become even stronger for the family. When you look at the sea, what do you think of? I think about a day when the weather is good and we can set off again. And that's your dream? I just want to leave this country with my children. So you'll set off again? Yes. And why? Because people die here every day. As Lebanon continues to be ravaged by a crippling financial crisis, Mohammed and Hossam look out to sea, hoping that maybe there's a better life waiting for them beyond the waves and the horizon.